Democratic Party, including, yeah, Russian lies to impact an, an election. The author of this book is amazing, billionaire at the barricades, and I assume maybe in, I think the year's 2020, she'll be the host of a brand new Fox News show, <laughs> The Ingram <laughs> Angle, which, oh, Monday. wait a minute, you start Monday. Oh, Monday. Monday. Oh. Yeah, we're, well, we're, we're, we'll, we get, we're hello, arranging the hello. pencils. We're, and I know you're number one on the New York bestseller list thing, and I know you're doing great. Here's the problem. We're waiting. When do we get the Ingram <laughs> angle? We're just getting, we're, we're doing the angle on the pencils in my office across the hall. So we're, we, we got you, the staplers. Just as soon as the stapler gets yeah, fixed, you I'm coming on. Yeah, you're going to be firing, on. like, you know, pencil darts at my head. Exactly. I, just, I don't, as if I don't have enough enemies. Thank you very much. <laughs> we're good. Uh, I just can't get over how they used Russian lies with Fusion GPS to influence the election and how everybody now has gone silent on Russia. Now that they know, and we've been saying this is going to boomerang back, never mind they knew Putin had infiltrated the country and everybody had knowledge of it. FBI had it, Eric Holder had it, the president probably had it, Obama in his presidential daily briefings. I cannot believe the degree of lying hypocrisy and, frankly, they put this country, country in danger. When you think about it, Sean, going back to the 90s, I had like a flashback of all the dirty politicking and the dirty campaigning and the use of private investigators the Clintons uh, utilized back in the 90s. Remember the name Terry Lenzner? He was a guy who was like going through people's garbage. And this is what... This Secret is police. What they, yeah. yeah, this is what they do. This is what they've always done. And now they've taken it to an international intrigue degree with, in, involving the former Soviet Union. And when you have a Kremlin written uh, uh, dossier that is compiled by the Chris, Christopher Steele fellow, and he puts it all together, but all the dirty, lurid, uh, fake details are provided by Russia. The idea that the highest level of the Clinton campaign, and perhaps even Hillary herself, didn't know about its provenance, didn't know where it came from. That just that just doesn't pass the straight face test. I mean, we, I guess we have to hear from Mrs. Clinton. I want to I want a real interview with her, not an interview with a favorable journalist. But she should come on and talk to a serious journalist about what Laura, she knew that's and never why this happen. proceeded this way. Well, she's afraid. Yeah. Well, of course, and and she's compromised. I mean, she was lashing out at maybe and uh, by name Fox News Channel by name just this week. What about this Uranium One? I want to get your take on Uranium One. Under no that, circumstances would no. any smart person ever give Vladimir 20 percent <laughs> of our, our, our uranium. Yeah. And then, and then you look at they knew he had Russian operatives in the country and that that was, that was their goal to corner the market. And they had an informant inside telling them about everything they're doing, bribery, kickbacks, extortion, all this. How could this possibly happen? Well, I, it, all of that that you just said, Sean, and then add the fact that we have this Committee on Foreign Investments, the CFIUS board, which includes pretty much the entire cabinet of the Obama administration. Obviously, Hillary sits on it, and the Department of Justice, Secretary of, Secretary of State, they all sit on this committee. Now, you could poll, I'd make 10 people you know, right across the street at Union Station, the train station in Washington, who don't know anything about politics, but if you ask them, okay, we, we could approve or disapprove of Russia getting 20 percent of our uranium that could be used for nuclear weapons, nuclear power. Do you think that's a good idea? Now, I bet 10 out of 10, maybe 9 if you can consider a drunk guy on the street. Probably well, say, probably, yeah, give it to yeah, well, probably no one, one of them is going to be liberal under, Joe Scarborough. So, you, yeah, get, you under, know, he doesn't have any a brain. circumstances. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, uh, but what you have here is they knew Vladimir Putin had infiltrated the country had spies in the country, was doing illegal activities in the country, and on top of them never being smart enough not to do whatever, but they all approved it anyway, and then the money comes back. I don't understand, like I can usually at least understand liberal logic. There's nothing here that makes any sense except that they sold out the country, a massive appeasement mentality, and that they're corrupt. Well, it's, it's, it's corrupt to the core. It's uh, per perhaps other financial interests that we don't know about. I think there's a lot that we just don't know. I think there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle, Sean, that we still don't know. We did not have a Justice Department 
that really wanted to be transparent in the way they handled uh, this this case, this case that it has many different aspects to it. They didn't want they didn't want an informant to testify to Congress. There was no real congressional oversight of this deal. Again, on its face, it's ludicrous that we ever would have approved no. this. Just on its face. But the fact that they're accusing Trump of collusion when all this was happening. That, that That is what truly makes, I think, Americans who are tuned yeah. into this really sick. Well, congrats on the book, Billionaires at the Barricades, uh, New York Times bestseller. Thank you. Uh, are you really showing up to work Monday, or is this all one big joke? Because I've never seen weekend. anybody sign a contract and never show up to work. You maybe never show week, up at work. What is up maybe, with that? Maybe the week after. We're, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just doing a very zen approach to my Fox show. It's just, I have to breathing exercises you're, you're beginning, before I start. You're, you're like O'Reilly, but O'Reilly took off, and, but he had worked here 20 years. You're taking as many days off as him. Well, that, what is that up with is that? A, that is a low blow. I am, not, <laughs> I, am, I am working hard across the hall on my desk. Okay, so we're going to really see you Monday. You promise? Monday. And are you going to pass? Are we going to pass like oh, a, I'm gonna pass. a drink through the... I'm going to say, oh, there's an empty chair. Way. She didn't that show way. up. Hannity has an extra hand, hour. you got to hand me something. Kilmeade the... will fill in because Kilmeade's on every other hour of the day. So, all right, the Ingram angle starts Monday. Because politics can make us silent when we should speak, and silence can equal complicity. I have children and grandchildren to answer to. And so, Mr. President, I will not be complicit or silent. Based on previous statements and certainly based on the lack of support that he has from the people of Arizona, it's probably a good move. Do you think uh, the president's debasing the nation? Uh, I don't think there's any question, but that's the case. When he gets hit, he's going to hit back, and uh, I think Senator Corker knows that, and he's you know, maybe trying to get a headline or two on his way out the door. Pretty remarkable day with two Republican senators speaking out pretty aggressively against the Republican president, who obviously is trying to get tax reform across the finish line and needs those votes. Senator Flake saying he's not going to run for re-election. Senator Corker obviously wasn't already, but stepping up the rhetorical battle between the president and Senator Corker. Here's another senator about whether that affects votes. Reasonable people get mad sometimes, and reasonable people have emotions sometimes. And reason people say things sometimes they shouldn't say. But I don't believe one for one second that Jeff Flake or Bob Corker or Bob Corker or John McCain or anybody else would allow their personal feelings to impact what's best for this country. And that's what I believe. And you can write that down and take it home to mama. Take it home to mama. All right, let's bring in our panel. Joining me here at the White House, Catherine Lucy, White House reporter for the Associated Press. From our Washington bureau, Laura Ingram, host of the Ingram Angle, which premieres here on Fox News Monday, October 30th, 10 p.m. Eastern. And former White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer. Uh, Catherine, let me start with you. It was an amazing day as it developed. Started with Senator Corker on morning shows and then a kind of a tweet rhetorical volley back and forth. Absolutely. I mean, I think we're starting to need to coin new words for remarkable day or unbelievable day. Uh, yes, this uh, we've been through about five news cycles already, I think. And uh, yes, you saw the president and a senator of his own party engaging in this war of words right before the president was heading to the Capitol to talk about what is a key priority for him and Republicans, which is tax reform. By all accounts, and, and his latest tweet suggests he had standing ovations and senators got along in that meeting um, and that it went well. There certainly was. I was uh, in the hallway outside the meeting. Um, there certainly was applause. We heard that. We have heard you know, some, some folks talking about the meeting saying that it was a positive conversation. But I mean, this is a tax plan that we still have yet to hear about key details on. They haven't worked everything out. We saw that this week, the back and forth about how they would treat 401k. So there's a lot of work yet to do. Laura, your thoughts on today? Well, I think that uh, thinking of someone like Jeff Flake uh, in his own state, uh, he would not have won uh, the, his primary challenge against Kelly Ward. I was there last Tuesday, and it was obvious on the ground there that there was just no constituency 
for you know his kind of open borders, endless war, uh, trade deals that are very imbalanced. There was no constituency for that. And I understand you know he's angry about the election. He didn't vote for Donald Trump. This is a continuation, Brett, of la last year's primary, and it's still it's still playing out. And the establishment's striking back. And I, I'm not surprised that they are. They don't like the populist conservative movement, and that seems to be what's gaining steam. And I say you know Trump Trump's won most of these arguments over the past ten months with the establishment, but he still does need them. So it's a, it's a balance that he has to play here as well. All right. Well, I just don't know how you can look at events today and not declare that Donald Trump won and Steve Bannon won. The fact of the matter is the people they like least, the establishment organizations inside, people inside the Republican Party, are not running for re-election because Donald Trump has helped chase them out of the party. But go back in time. It's, it is true. You go back to the primary and, and 16 candidates, many of them cut from the same cloth as Corker and, and of Flake couldn't compete with Donald Trump. Ted Cruz and Donald Trump got 80 percent of all Republican votes cast in that primary. The establishment candidates got less than 20 percent state by state by state from the beginning to the very end. And so now you are seeing that manifestation of it play out in the Senate. What I have a hard time wrapping my, eye, my, my mind around is they said you must fight, you must stop, you must stand up to President Trump, but then they don't run. It seems to me if, if you feel that fervently about standing up to fight, then you go through your primary and you prove that you can move Republicans to your direction. But instead of fighting, they, they yielded. And that's why I think it's a victory for Donald Trump. But Ari, let me ask you about these these tweets and whether the pushback, you know, the counterpuncher that Donald Trump is, uh, is effective in this environment. Bob Corker, who helped President Obama give us a bad Iran deal, couldn't get elected dog catcher in Tennessee, he's now fighting tax cuts, uh, goes on to say that, that Corker dropped out of the race when I refused to endorse him and now is only negative on anything Trump. Look at his record. Uh, He's pushing back, obviously, and whenever anything critical is said about this president, he pushes back. But in this environment, when you have to get something across the finish line, um, does that work? Yeah, but look what was heading across the finish line that helped bring about this end result with all these tweets. A New York Times story on October 20th came out that said Republicans consider sharp cuts in 401k contribution limits. The president then tweeted, we're never going to let that happen. No, we're not changing 401ks. And then Senator Corker advised the president, stay out of tax policy. Don't get into it. Frankly, I think this is where the president used a tweet on policy quite effectively. And he was hearing then from a senator, don't put your nose in congressional business. And I can understand congressmen wanting the president not get involved in the minutia of tax bills. But in this case, if the Republican Party had gone down that road on 401ks, President Trump's tweet probably saved the Republican Party from hurting themselves badly. And, Brad, I think there's one thing that we should, we should remember in listening to what uh, we heard today from Jeff Flake. Just if you, if you didn't hear his voice, you just read it. This could be a speech that was delivered by Nancy Pelosi. This could have been a speech that was delivered by Chuck Schumer. Almost almost everything that the press is focusing on, it's not that, you know, he's the conscience of the conservative movement. It's the tone, the vitriol, this, that. He lost. His view of conservatism is receding. Maybe it'll come back someday. But right now, the middle class in America has, is tired of getting kicked to the curb. And if you're going to work for big business, then you might as well just go work for big business. So Jeff Lake should go work for big business. In the meantime, the people who are going to focus on the ordinary Americans working every day for a living, those people who turned out to vote for Donald Trump, you have to advance this agenda. And if you don't advance the agenda, and if you speak ill of President Trump more often than you speak ill of any, any random Democrat, it's probably not going to work out, out all that well for you right now. Yeah. So he's going to stamp his feet. But I don't think, I don't think it's going to make his viewpoint, his views, Brett, more popular within the Republican ranks. His Senator, views are unpopular. Senator Flank wrote a book called uh, Conscience of a Conservative, and it was pretty critical of, of President Trump. Obviously, that title uh, sharing from Arizona, uh, Barry Goldwater, who, went after he lost the presidential race, did stay in the Senate for many, many years afterwards. and wrote, ran again. I guess that's the criticism is why not run if you're standing up on principle. Yeah, and I think these lawmakers have obviously made the decision this is not a productive place for them to be, but it really does, I mean, what we've been talking about here and what we've seen today, it does speak to the divides in the party, which are not going to get worked out today. And how do, how does this White House figure out a way to, to work with the Senate while also, you know, trying to advance candidates that they see as being on their agenda?